Okay, so um, let's get straight into it. I mean, like with all our, our uh, chats, um, it's usually good to know um, how you started in the game um, and your professional and educationary journey from when you first started in this in the scene to where you are now, and then we can chat more specifics. Let's do it. Um, hey guys. Um, right, I'll just give a quick run through. Well, maybe not so quick. I'll run through of my path. Um, I start. I did my educational um, first step into the business. Um, I studied media and communications as my postgrad um, at LSE in London. And then I was a double master program, and the second year was at USC in California, in LA. And there, um, generally the US education system is much more flexible in terms of that you can pick your classes and kind of create um, the course how you want it to be. So whilst I was studying at Annenberg College of Communication, there was also Thornton School of Music. So I thought, hey, I'll check out some music classes. Um, introduction to music business, music law, music publishing. And then I just realized, I'm like, hmm, I like this. I mean, I was already going out a lot, you know, partying, going to raves and everything. So it was always a passion of mine. And then taking these classes made me see, I'm like, you know, there's, there's a lot to be done here, a lot of this different aspects to get into. And then, um, I, yeah, so that was the educational background. Um, prior to that, I had already in done an internship at Sony Music for Mike Pickering at Deconstruction, actually, which was my first um, dab in the... Um, label world, and then, yeah, what did I do then? Let me have a thing, that was quite, this was in 2012, yeah, the internship at Sony, and then after my second work experience was at Universal Music Distribution, where I learned the distribution side of things, which was also very interesting, and from then I worked, um, went to work in a booking agency, I worked for Spin Artist Agency, which was actually um, where Avicii was being booked by David Brady, I was his PA, for a couple of months um, in that LA. That was in the US? That was in LA, yeah. So that was that was at this kind of at the same time when I was doing the classes at Thornton School of Music. So that was really my, when I was really getting a grasp of the business, you know, and realizing, okay, all these different components that there are to management. Um, you know, how does the label work? What does the publisher do? What does a record deal entail? Um, what's the relationship between a booking agent and a manager? which I think is a question that comes up again and again, who does what and so forth. Um, then, yeah, so then I was working um, in LA and then what actually took me away from that job was just the fact that I didn't want to be in LA. I wanted to be back in Europe. And that year I went to uh, WMC in Miami and I was actually just going there to party and have a good time and I met um, a f now a friend of mine who introduced me to a manager in London. Um, this manager was Phil Sales, and he was working for 360 at the time. And uh, my friend Nick, who I met in Miami, you know, I was telling him, I kind of want to get back to Europe, but I don't really know what to do. I think I have a really good thing going here in LA, working, you know, a bit more in the EDM world, but still really in the world I wanted to be in. You know, I was helping run Avicii's Vegas residencies and doing some really cool stuff but just wasn't geographically where I wanted to be. So I was a little bit torn between giving that up and going back to there. And my friend Nick was just like, hey, you should just go to London, meet with Phil, maybe they have something at 360. So I was like, okay, I'll give that a go. Flew over there, there was a you know, bunch of back and forth, couple of interviews, and then a position opened up for me there um, where I was working as Phil's assistant across his roster. And the roster at the time was uh, Sasha. Um, feed me uh, slash spore, which is like drum and bass, dubstepy kind of vibes, and then funk agenda also. So I was really part of working at 360 more. 360 is more, let's say, underground roster. You know, they managed a whole wide range of artists from Calvin Harris and Dead Mouse to working with Jay Z, via Rock Nation to bands. And for me, it was always about electronic. You know, I was always raving, always into the electronic music world, and it was very clear for me that my musical career would be in that section of the music biz. So worked for 360 for a couple of years as Phil's assistant, then started signing my own artist. My first own signing was Henry Size, actually. So I worked with him for a while, then also started working with Agoria, um, various other artists. And then in 2016, um, the internal structure of 360 changed a little bit. Um, I had actually gone to Berlin to open 360 Berlin. So 
because they wanted to expand and build more international offices around the world. And me um, being from Germany made sense for me to run the Berlin office. Um, but as everything in life, sometimes you know a curveball comes your way, and the company changed directions and um, decided to close their whole European operation. So then I was in Berlin, and I was like, "Hmm, okay, what what do I do now? I've just moved to Berlin. I, you know, just started, found an office space, found some managers, and now this isn't going ahead. So that was a little bit of a crossroads." Um, and then I was kind of thinking, do I join another management company or should I see if I can do this by myself? Um, and I chose the latter and then I opened my own company called Key. Um, and I've been working with them for myself as, as that for three years now, I think since 2016, yeah. And then um, my role with Sasha just became more and more prominent. Um, and I think, you know, now that's really who I've spent most of my time working on. And as part of that, also focused a lot on his label, Last Night on Earth. So then as manager, I also took on the role as label manager, um, which somehow is actually two completely different jobs. But for me, it's just become one job because I think it's such an integral part of Sasha's identity as well, Last Night on Earth is. Um, so now I do all the releases, um, we just started doing vinyl again, I do all the parties, I do all the merchandise, I do, I just do everything, A to Z, basically. And um, yeah, I'm now living in Ibiza, just spent the summer there, which is also where he lives. Um, what I can always advise is be as close to your artists as possible. You know, having FaceTime with the people you work with is more valuable than anything else. It's just so much so much better than just being on the phone, let alone being on an email, you know, you get so much more done. Um, and I'm here now, That's I think that's it, yeah. Quite a journey. <laughs> um, well, well, going back to some of the earlier parts, um, you said you did an internship. Do you think that that is uh, good advice for anyone that wants to perhaps get into artist management, label management? Uh, do you think an internship in the electronic music sphere is relevant still and would you recommend it? I think so, yeah. I mean, um, I think maybe because you have to start somewhere, right? And I think the competition is so big in this industry and so many people want to get into it. So I think an internship is really worth it for, for two reasons. A, just to learn, you know. I think for me the struggle was, I was like, I know I want to be in the music industry. I know I'm not an artist, um, so I want to be in the business. But then it's like, okay, are you a manager? Are you a booking agent? Do you work for a record label? Are you a distributor? Are you a publisher? Are you a PR agent? Like there's just so many different aspects. And I think unless you really throw yourself in there and start with something, you're not really gonna find your way. And I'm really happy that I went through each, I kind of pretty much worked in every, or dabbled in every bit of this field. So now I'm in management, I'm like, I know this is the part I wanna be in. But I think unless you have internships or unless you have some work experience in these different fields, no one can really explain it to you. You have to do it and you have to feel it to really get it. And another reason why an internship is just a good entryway or some form of work experience is just because to do this job, you have to have a network, you know? And I think that's something, also one of the reasons why everyone is probably here to build their network and to meet people. and as a manager or as anyone in this business, you don't have anything if you don't know people because a lot of things that we do and we achieve is because I'm calling in favors, be like, hey dude, can you help me with this? Or do you know a person here? Like if I couldn't rely on my network, like I couldn't do even 10% of the things I do. And again, if you're just, you know, you can't just rock up and all of a sudden know everyone. You have to have someone that mentors you. You know, for me, I was lucky enough that Mike Pickering was one of the first people that introduced me to people. So. That was a great first mentor to have, you know? So, um, so yeah, to answer your question, I, I think if you can find the right person, even if it's just working for an individual or working for a company, it's a really valuable first step to get into the business and to start to know your way. Uh, I mean, you also seem to study in different continents. You had quite a few different. Do, do you think that, that uh, uh, studying or interning outside of your usual comfort zone, having such an international flavor has stood you in good stead? And would, is that something you'd recommend to someone that really wants to build a big, big network? 100%, I think it's so important. I mean, especially in the musical hubs of like, I mean, I've been between Berlin, London, LA, and Ibiza for the last like 10 years now, all pretty important um, places in the 
for the electronic music industry in particular. And I think it helps in two kind of ways. It helps, A, again, with just having your network in LA and having your network in these different cities, but more so, I think it just really builds your confidence. Because I could say I could probably move anywhere tomorrow and I'd feel, I mean, maybe not anywhere, but you know, to most places. And I'd feel quite comfortable getting around and you just become more social and open. You start talking to people and I think being confident is really important if you want to be a manager because essentially you're representing someone. So you have to be confident for yourself but also for what you're representing. So the more you travel and the more experience you have in different places and the more you know about the world, um, I think that will only have a positive influence on your skills as a manager or whichever profession you choose to have. Um, when you talk about skills as a manager, um, do you think that it is required to have people skills, administrational skills, creative? Uh, I mean, as a manager, do you find that you are more dealing with personalities and people, or is it a very administrative, creative, logistical responsibility that you have to fulfill for your artist? I think there's two sides to it. I think it also, I think what I want to say is that the management for every artist is completely different. So for example, what I do for Sasha and what I do for someone like maybe Benjamin Damage is varies completely. You know, so I think one thing that's very important is you have to have people skills. You have to understand how to deal with creative personalities because some people can be difficult and I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. It's just they're very creative and they have their own vision, you know, and they feel so strongly about that, that you have to find a way to respect that, but maybe also challenge that. You know, a good manager is also to sometimes challenge your artists and maybe, maybe you don't always disagree, but it is because of this disagreement that you maybe find a whole new, you know, vision, a whole new dimension to what might be possible. So I think people skills are very important. I mean, if you're, if you're a shy, really antisocial person, I probably would say management might not be the best thing for you. Um, but you also have to be super organized, you know? And if you're not super organized, that's fine, but then you need to have someone, an assistant or someone that works alongside you that can be super organized. I've also worked, you know, for people that maybe weren't that organized, but I, from my nature, I think I'm very quite organized. I keep on top of deadlines and stuff, you know? I. I love a good folder or like a good Excel sheet. So there's definitely also that side of it, especially when you, you know, you work with touring, you work with budgets and everything, and that needs to have some sort of structure to it. You can't, a lot of it is winging it sometimes. Sometimes you just have to wing it and just go with it. But you need to have a backbone, especially to an artist maybe as big as Sasha, like you can't all be airy fairy, you know? So, Well, I yeah. mean, it's interesting, but, like having an artist like Sasha, who's obviously had a long career, has loads of experience, he's, he's produced, he's toured, he knows the game. Um, and when you take on an artist like that, that is so established, do you find yourself having to compromise what you think is good management? Or, or do you challenge him? And do you think that that is your responsibility, is to challenge and to, to be as frank as you can with him versus someone that probably thinks and has done a lot? Well, I'm gonna be completely transparent and say that I've been working with Sasha for six years now and our relationship has really developed over time. So when I first started working for him, I was 20, I had just turned 24 and um, you know, I was getting involved in a label and I was just, it was very an administrative job. You know, I was taking care of his touring and his itineraries and his logistics and I wasn't really involved in A&R in the label, let alone going with him into the studio or you know, contributing what vocalists I think he should work with. You know, it doesn't start off like that. And I think um, it's really that relationship that has developed so much over time that now it's at the point where you know, I spend two weeks at his house and work from his house and play with his kids and it's really become a friendship where I kind of actually feel part of the family. So now you know, when we do our a &R sessions, he'll be like, what do you think? You know, he will ask me what I think, and especially when we go through signing processes, I'll be like, I think this is really good, this will do really well, and we might disagree, but sometimes he'll be like, okay, sign it if you think it's good. You know, we've established that development of trust. Um, I've also, a couple of months ago, became a partner in the label, so we've actually, like, a shared owners now of Last Night on Earth, which has, I think, maybe brought the trust to even another level, because essentially, if I choose to take a risk, I'm not taking a risk on his behalf, like, we're taking this risk, let's say, you know? so. Um, but yeah, I think to be a good manager, you have, I mean, sometimes you have to disagree with someone, right? Yeah, it, 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 be it in a relationship or with your parents or with your sister or with your artist, you can't always be in the same opinion. And I think what's really important is how do you handle that, you know? If I don't think 
if I disagree or if maybe I think that I have a better proposal, it's just, you know, communicating that in the correct way is what's important. Be like, hey, your idea is cool, but you know, maybe what about this? I think rather than just saying, no, your idea, your idea sucks, yeah. for example. Uh, I mean, it leads me to the next question is loyalties. I mean, uh, I've also managed artists and uh, very often you have an artist and they reach a certain level of success and their loyalties can be questioned. Do you think that um, that loyalty that, that you expect um, should be contracted? Can one protect themselves against these kind of loyalties? Or is it something that you earn and like you said, become part of the team and invest of yourself? Are you talking to the loyalty to the manager, let's say, or to Correct. the team? Correct, yeah. loyalty to the manager. Um, I think this it can also be, I mean, usually if you're working as part of a bigger management company, um, most management, when we're at 360, you have contracts with the artists. I think when you're working with, you know, entities like people like Calvin and stuff, or, you know, really, you know, big mainstream artists, and yeah, there definitely has to be some sort of contract in place. I personally don't have contract, actually, no, that's actually not true. I do have a contract in place now, but I didn't have a contract in place for the longest time. And we actually just put this contract in place as more of an administrative kind of thing, but it's a really kind of gray area, and I don't actually really know how to answer that question that well, because you do have to protect yourself, of course, but I also think that a manager-artist is such a close relationship, and if one of the per people isn't happy, you should be able to leave, you know, because you're not gonna be able to manage someone well if you're not getting along, and if you're forcing your artist to remain in this relationship because of a contract, you're not gonna get anywhere. You know, it's gonna create a bad vibe, and so I think it's, I, I think there needs to be some paperwork in place to maybe protect yourself financially as well, because normally when you get out of a deal, um, there's like a sunset period, right, where you still commission on things that you have helped bring in, um, you know, details to be, case specific, but yeah, I think you need to find the right balance, and it also just depends, if you're signing a new artist that you maybe don't know, then yeah, maybe you do need to put something in place, but I'm also, you know, I do st still believe in loyalty and in trust, and you know, that there's a certain relationship between people that you need to nurture and value. Okay, and let's take it one step deeper now. I mean, uh, I know that mental health is something that's close to you. I mean, you've worked close with, with Tim and Asher and Avicii and his team, and Sasha is is very vocal, and, and you know he's he's been a, a very um, vocal supporter to highlight uh, the um, mental health. As a manager, do you feel your responsibility is the well-being of the mental state and of that person, or ultimately purely their career and their professional output? I think it's impossible to separate one from the other because if you don't care about someone's well-being, then how can you care about their career, right? Because their career is their life and their well-being is their life. So I think the two overlap. At the same time, I think you can't hold yourself accountable for everything, you know? So if something goes wrong, if someone, you know, is having a bad time, it's not your fault, you know? I think what you need to do is you need to create a support system or you need to um, take your relationship to the point where your artist feels that like they can talk to you if they have a problem, you know? If, they have a problem and you find out about it six months later, then, you know, that's a sad situation. It might, but then, even then, it might still not be your fault. But I think if you, you have to try to create an environment where, you have to, where the artist feels comfortable to talk to you about anything, be that good or bad. And I don't think that you can just say, I care only about your career, I don't care about your personal life, I don't care about, you know, that's, it's, it's, they're too interlinked. It's too, because I think an artist, it's not, it's, not what, it's not what they do, it's who they are, right? It's not like, you know, I work, I don't know, as a postman or something like that. And that's yeah. a stupid example, but you know what I mean. It's yeah. really, it's your whole identity. So one is so closely interlinked with the other that I think you, are, you need to be involved in every aspect. Uh, being involved in every aspect leads me to my next question. Um, and I'm sure you've been asked a thousand times. Um, the role of the manager versus the agent should they be interlinked? Is the agent responsible to the manager? Is the manager responsible to the artist? Should the agent be purely responsible for the artist's um, uh, interests? I mean, uh, in a nutshell, do you think that that responsibility should be done by one person or entity or continue with it being two separate responsibilities? I think it should be two separate responsibilities. I think it's really important to have that interplay between agent and manager and I really like all the agents that we work with and we have a really good relationship, but it's also good 
to play a good cop, bad cop against a promoter sometimes, for example, you know, when agent can go back and be like, no, manager said this, you know, we can't do that. So you have to, you have to work as a team, you know, and I think it's an important, and I am a big believer in collaboration because, and yeah, team working, because the reality of the situation is people are good at different things, right? You can't be the best at everything. So, you know, I think two brains together working on a strategy for our artists is going to most likely be better than just one brain. So I think as long as you're working with the right people, and again, sometimes it's fine to disagree, I think you can really achieve the most in, you know, in having the setup. And also I think for an artist of the size like Sasha, for example, there needs to be, you know, you can't just be one person handling everything. You know, in our setup, for example, we have Ian that handles the world, and then we have Emma that handles North America, and we have a very good relationship with all of us. Um, the most important thing that I can't say enough is to communicate with everyone in your team again and again and again, you know, have calls, WhatsApp emails, and make sure that everyone's on the same page. And the more you communicate, I actually find that the more you communicate at some point, the less you will need to communicate because you will get so used to each other's interplay and working with each other that things will just take a natural flow, which is where I feel we're at at the moment. Um, you said earlier that, I mean, your, your journey and everything that you did was born out of a, a passion for the music and a passion for the scene. Um, do you have to sustain that passion? Do you still have that passion? Or as you grow as a person, uh, does that passion grow and change as well? I mean, can you still be at the top of your game if you're not fully immersed in the nightlife like you were 10, 15 years ago? I'm still pretty immersed in the nightlife. <laughs> I mean, I still go out quite a lot. Um, I think that, you know, you don't have to be raving every weekend, you know, for two days straight anymore. But I do think that you need to like the music and like what you work on and it's important that you kind of have some sort of understanding of what's going on in the scene and that doesn't mean that you need to be at fabric until 8 a.m every weekend or not you know but i still go to i mean just like in august i went to deck mantel festival i had no artists playing there i just wanted to go i saw the lineup i was like ski mask with zanger brothers like that sounds awesome let's go check that out you know like i love going to listen to music and and it was so cool. I went to Dak Matata backstage band. I didn't go into the backstage once. I was just on the dance floor and I just loved it. And it just gave me like inspirations. And afterwards I went back to Sasha. I'm like, man, we should listen to that set. And then that inspires him. And it just, it's a, I'm in it because I love music, you know? So actually I think if it gets to the point where I don't like music anymore, I think I'll just, I mean, I also teach yoga. I'll just do that, you know? <laughs> and if, if you were approached by a, an electronic artist who's in the EDM sphere, could you and would you and should you still be able to take on a client or work with an artist that is in a realm of music that perhaps you're not passionate about? I mean, uh, should an, a manager purely surround themselves with the artists that they think are relevant to their personal taste in music? Or, you know, take on a, an EDM or a, an artist that jumps into crowds on, on, on inflatable boats? <laughs> um, I think that depends on the manager. I think, um, for me personally, it's not possible. Straight up, I cannot. That's the question. I, for me personally, no, I cannot. I, I can't, I need, because for me, the the things I love most about my job is like next week, next Thursday, Friday, I'm going to the studio with Sasha in London. And I can't wait to hear the music or see, you know, what he's doing and I'll just sit and I'll listen and I'll input and we'll just have a really creative just music day, you know, no phones, no anything, just listening to weird beats and wonky stuff and wild bass lines, you know? So if I don't enjoy that, how can I give my honest comment or how can I A&R label if I don't really like the music? It's, it's hard. But there's also the flip side, obviously, you know, where Maybe if you're working in a big management company and you have a really high grossing artist coming to you, hey, we're looking for management and need someone to rep that. Obviously, if you can, it's great. But for me personally, if I don't have to, I would choose to work with music that I love and that I can understand. And I'm not saying that EDM is bad music ever. You know, I'm not one of those people that are really underground and I hate the mainstream at all. It's just from my personal taste, it's what I can relate to and it's the business that I know. Um, now, let's talk about something that's a bit more relevant to the audience we have here, is um, any aspiring acts, and you know, pretty much the, the title of, of this chat is, what do the, uh, an aspiring artist, producing artist, uh, need to do to catch your eye? What, what, what would you recommend for someone to get a manager at the right level which can push their career forward? 
persistence is so important. You know, I get approached so many times and even I get sent so many demos, you know, and I'm gonna be completely honest, I can't listen to everything and I don't listen to everything. And it's the way you present yourself first, you know, when you send an email, for example, sending demos or when you first meet someone is so important, you know, I think it comes back down to confidence and, you know, clarity and just looking professional is really, really important. Um, and I think, yeah, just persistence. I think just trying to be at as many things as you can. Because if you see someone over and over again, right, we're, like, we're creatures of habit, right? So if I see your face every day, I'm like, who is that guy? I see him everywhere, right? And that's kind of how I got my first job as well, because I was just going to everything. I and mean, I was literally at every party that I could go to, I was there. And then I just started meeting the right people, and then from there it snowballed. So I think just, you know, and it doesn't mean that you have to go and party all the time, but go to these conferences or go and just try to hang out. And then, you know, I think there's also a little bit of luck and you have to be at the right place at the, at the right time sometimes. And I'm a strong believer in karma, you know, and if it's meant to happen, it will happen. Like, I really believe that and you have to too. But I think, yeah, you just have to be persistent and don't get discouraged because it's also different now than maybe when I started, you know, competition is higher, there's m the business is much bigger, there's many more people that wanna get in it, so it's more difficult maybe than it was when I first started. But I think be persistent and, you know, believe in what you do, and if it's meant to be, it will, it will happen for you. Uh, and what kind of things are you specifically looking for in a new artist, someone that isn't established, someone you've not heard of before, you say how they present themselves, um, a few more specifics. I mean, are you looking for a, a high volume of repertoire? Are you looking for a, um, lots of social response activity? Are you looking for a certain look or sound? Uh, what, you know, in probably the order of importance, what's the first most important thing that you look for? And then a few more things below that. Well, the very first thing, I'm just going to take this now from, uh, let's say, like an A&R perspective from when I'm signing a, a, a record rather than maybe from a manager's perspective. Well, uh, just here, when you're looking at A&R, do you look to take artists on that you signed the label as well? Sometimes, yes. Yeah, sometimes I have done in the past. Yeah. I mean, a lot, I always look at, we're always kind of looking at what is coming through on Last Tide on Earth. And it'll actually be like sometimes a decision that Sasha and we, we will make together, you know, I'll be like, here we just want to sign an EP, but he'll be like, this artist really has something. And we're like, maybe we want to grow it. Can we... You know, can this person maybe even do a remix for Sasha and we can help them elevate their career and I'll kind of be like mentoring them on the side. So there's a lot of crossover between the two things. And I think um, what we're always looking for is just something, it's, I mean, it's hard to put your finger on it, but just something that stands out and something that's just a little bit different. You know, I think you need to have an edge. I think if you're just blending in with the masses, then, you know, it's not interesting for anyone and it's hard for a manager to really take you to the next level because you know, the sound is kind of what's the, what's the most important, right? So it has to stand out. Um, the other thing is, yeah, I mean, I have to look at Spotify streams and I have to look at social responses because at the end of the day, I also need to make money of the release or at least of most releases I should make money in an ideal situation. So yeah, you do have to look at um, the online presence. Of course you do. Um, and then in terms of if I meet someone face to face, I think what I'm really looking for is, again, it's just, just confident. You know, I feel like if someone is really believing in what they're doing, then they're most more likely to convince me to believe in them too, you know? So if they come up to me like, hey, I have these records and they're great and I think you'll really like them, it's, I'm much more inclined to listen to them and be like, hey, I've got this and maybe if you have some time, maybe you can maybe check it out. You know what I mean? There's a certain way to deliver the same message but in a much different manner. So I think, again, it just comes back down to confident, you know, be confident and believe in what you're doing if you want other people to believe it too. Um, going to the label, I mean, obviously there's so much music being made and put out now, it's easier than ever to set up a label or to put music out. Um, and on the flip side of that, it's more and more difficult to monetize um, electronic music and you put out. Do you use the label, especially with Lost on Earth and Sasha's label, as a tool to promote the artists and the artist's creativity? Or do you see them as separate entities and this is the label and that's one business and this is my artist's business? Or, or do you use the one to, to feed the other? I think for Sasha in particular, Last Night on Earth has become an integral part of who he is and what he does now. You know, I think um, we have actually just recently set it up as two separate entities in terms of a financial aspect because we have so many different revenue streams. But yes, I think um, I mean, this might be uh, different for different artists and different labels, but in my case in particular, I definitely see Last Night on Earth very associated to Sasha. And, we're now just really trying to branch out of what we're doing with Last Night on Earth as a brand. 
Um, I'm working on building more of a fashion aspect to it as well. I'm working with some designers in London to look um, you know, at tapping into that kind of market. Um, we're also just rolling out a new events series with a new concept. We just did our launch party at Watergate in Berlin. We're doing Tobacco Dog in London next Saturday. Um, then we're doing Amsterdam. Then we're going into Vavrung in Brazil. And then we're doing a North American run. And then we're looking at doing something bigger next, next summer. So that's a really good way for, you know, for, for us to kind of run a separate brand alongside Sasha. You know? And those, those two can completely coexist. But it essentially, it gives you more to talk about. And it also can really take the pressure off the artist. Because you know? if the artist maybe cannot deliver a release right now or needs to take some time away or God knows what, you know, there's other stuff that you've got going on. Um, so for me, yeah, they're very, very, very inter intertwined, I guess, and I can't, I can't really separate the two from another. Um, uh, one thing, I mean, is um, a very important part of any producing artist's career is their collaborations and their peers and who's playing their music and how they re re relate and deal with, 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 with other producing artists. Sasha has relationships digweed. I mean, do you leave your artists to manage their own relationships with other artists themselves when it comes to remixing and sharing their music and the, the artistic communication between them? Or is it something that you recommend goes through you? Um, so with Sasha, for example, it will, I, will, I will usually leave it to him because he will have all those relationships longer. So especially for c collaborations, I mean, he will usually take care of those. Where I will come in as if we're looking for vocalists. Let's say, especially right now, we're in like record writing process, so we're looking for top lines and vocalists on certain tracks. So we'll go through, you know, we have a, like a Spotify playlist with things that we like, or he'll send me things that he likes, and then I will reach out to all of those artists, and then I will facilitate the communication. But in terms of the artistic and in terms of the really creative process, I think for me that needs to be left to the artist. I think otherwise there's too many chefs in the kitchen. I think. You know, when it comes to making the deal or setting up, uh, you know, how you work together, that's fine. But in terms of really the actual creative process, I personally leave that to the artist. Um, with other artists that I that I work on um, or that I have worked on, you know, I've uh, maybe suggested ideas for collaborations that would help us from a positioning stance. You know, maybe, um, for example, with um, uh, with Benjamin Damage, we're looking at doing a co-headline analog live tour with Oniva. Um, from France, so you know we kind of thought that they could both benefit from each other because they both have strengths in different markets and they're both kind of doing the same thing like really nerdy hardware setup kind of vibe, you know, so sometimes you see these opportunities and you're like, oh, this could work together and then maybe you bring two people together. So again, it really depends on the artist and who you're working with. There's not really a blueprint set for this is how you manage an artist. It depends on who the artist is. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, I mean, um, we've spoken about the IMS and and the the gender equality and the position of a woman in the electronic scene. Um, and have you found it difficult? Have you seen it change for the better, for the worse, since you started on your on your journey? Uh, and just a comment that I've seen is, you know, in, in the years that we've been booking and working with managers it seems to be the most influential and strongest managers are usually women. Do you think that women are more in tune to managing? Uh, and have you seen the landscape change? Um, I mean, <laughs> I think that there's, I, I do think that's, I'm, I'm trying not to engage in this topic too much, to be honest, sometimes. But I do think that there's much more of a presence of you know, females now in the industry. Uh, but everything that she said, so is doing, and so forth. With management in particular, I think there's always been a few key female managers that have been um, around for a long time, you know, that have, you know, been some of the greatest managers maybe that there have been. Um, for me, I have to say, I've never really found it that difficult being a female. For me, the thing that I found difficult was age, because I became, or I started working for Sasha when I was really, really young, and I even still get it today. So people are like, oh, you're really young. You know, and then sometimes people maybe don't take me as seriously. Um, so that's actually something that I've struggled with a bit more than the fact that I'm a woman. It, it would be a nice conversation to first to start having because we've spent a lot of time talking about gender, and I think you're right. You know, there's a lot of um, energy and efficiency and creativity that, that comes from, from younger people, and you're right. Uh, and a lot of the old guard, excuse the pun, are still very much uh, ruling the roost, uh, and there is a lot that could be learned, so. I mean, I can't tell you how many, how many times it happens, actually, how many times it happens to me um, when I go into a meeting, 
and my name Marin. I mean, sometimes people also think I'm a guy. This happened many times. People are like, oh, you're Marin? I thought you looked different. I was like, yeah, you thought I was a dude, right? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that, that happens all the time. But I, more often than the female male thing is I really get people are like, oh, like I didn't think you were you know, this young. I thought you were older. But you know, that is what it is. You know, I've started, I started in this industry when I was pretty young. I've worked in it for a long time, and I've worked, you know, pretty hard. So I'm happy to be where where I am now. Uh, I think it's an inspiration to, especially, you know, uh, an event like this where we have a lot of people on their first step in, uh, and it's a testament to persistence, as you said, hard work. Persistence is key. <laughs> and and uh, uh, youthful creativity. Um, we've got a bit of time. If anybody has any questions, anybody wants to have or direct any questions, one question from the old part. You know, it's really interesting to hear talk about age. You know, it's, it, it, nobody really speaks about the ageist, uh, you know, of, of our industry. It's always men or women or so on. And some people can think you're too old as well as being too young. So uh, that's probably a great subject for, for Ibiza, you know, where we've got a, uh, a older and younger audience, I suppose. Uh, just going back to one point where we were talking about agents v managers. Because I'm interested, because we've started managing people. You know, we've run clubs and put festivals. We've been promoters for 20 years. Now we've become managers in the last couple of years. I'm interested in this relationship between agents and managers. Uh, in the end, who's the boss? I mean, forget the artist. We know the artist ultimately is the boss. But I, I, I tend to see that agents have a more short-term view of a an artist career you know it's money now big money you know get the numbers in where managers tend to be looking after their artists with a longer view so in the end could you put your foot down would you put your foot down if the you thought the agent was putting them in the wrong show for the wrong money at the wrong time definitely of course because i think yeah 100 percent um i think you really hit the nail on the head you know i think um as an agent of course you're getting the show you know and you're working as an agent, you're working directly on commission on that show, right? As a manager, you're working directly on commission over everything over a future period of time. So I'm happy to say no to a show now because A, I think maybe it's not the right look, or B, I think, hey, maybe if we wait six months, we can get a better show for a higher fee, you know, because it's still, the agent has a, like a strategic hat on, right? Whereas, uh, sorry, the manager has the strategy hat on. Whereas the agent is much more, okay, this is a show, I have this offer now, I'm trying to fill the diary. And then, you know, the agent will flip it around on you. If I'm going to be like, hey, the diary isn't looking as good as it should be, he'll be like, well, I sent you to shows and you didn't want to do them. Yeah. And I'll be like, well, they weren't good enough. Would, would, you take, you know? would you take the less money if it was a better show? Definitely. And we have done in the past. And especially for someone like Sasha, I think, um, you know, positioning and profile is so important. Yeah. So if we can play a good show on a really cool uh, lineup to the right audience. You know, we've played show, like Sub Club in Glasgow, you know, super small cap show. Maybe not the best fee in the world, but loves to play it, super fun, nice, proper rave to the right people. And yeah, of course, I think you have to have the balance. Sometimes you have to take the money show, definitely. But also it comes back to what you were saying, you know, do you really love what you do? And sometimes, you know, and some other managers might hate me for saying that, but sometimes it's just not about the money. Sometimes you have to do it something because it's really fun because you have to really, whatever you guys do, Forget not to have fun, right? Don't forget why you started working in this business. If you're an artist or a manager, I'm here because I still love the music. And I think that should always, you should always try to keep that at, as the, um, at the forefront. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. One more question over here. Uh, so you would put London as authentic if someone <coughs> for people trying to get their foot in the door, if they can't afford to get into an industry, for the sake maybe unpaid or to get paid might not be enough. I think, again, a lot of it is just like, it doesn't necessarily need to be London or LA. You know, I think even like being in, in smaller cities around Europe or, you know, I, I know that it can be very expensive to place yourself in those cities. I completely understand. I was fortunate that I got a scholarship, you know, which obviously really helped me with my, with my journey. But again, I think it's just important to, you know, 
try to show face at certain things, you know, even if you can't be living there all the time, you know, but there's a lot of um, electronic music cities like, you know, Berlin, for example, you know, where you can network and where you can meet a lot of people, and especially if you're based maybe, you know, somewhere within Europe in a smaller city, you can probably go to Berlin, you know, and you can try and meet the right people there and you can try and network there. Um, but yeah, that is that is kind of what I would advise, I guess. I mean, I mean to kind of answer your question, and you can relate to coming from South Africa, is um, I was studying law, I was in a university, I packed it all and I went to Ibiza with 500 rand, which didn't last me a few days. Um, and it was just about immersion, you know, do, loving the nightlife, go in there and being prepared to make an absolute fist of it. Whatever you do, get by and, you know, Persistence, throw yourself in there, yeah. Just really just throw yourself in the deep end. And fun. And, you know. Fun, fun, fun. Exactly. <laughs> cool. No, rant. South African rant. <laughs> I spent it in the airport. Uh, any one time for one more question? Or. Yes. I think again, it, I think again, there's no blueprint of when you should take on a manager. I think it also depends very much of what kind of artist you are, because there's some artists that are just very kind of creative and that all they want to do is be in the studio and make music and that can't actually have the you know managerial hat on. Whereas I know other artists that are just super organized, super focused, and they can kind of you know take care of their own. I think once you get to a certain level, you need to take on management. But I think it's, and especially once you start having other projects, you know, once you maybe start having a label, once you start running an event series, once you start having all of these external, you know, factors that kind of play into your career, then you will definitely, well, most likely you will need management, you know. Some, but some artists, some developing artists might need it at a much younger stage because maybe they're just, you know, away with the fairies and all they want to do is be in the studio and write records, you know, so they might need someone much earlier. Um, so that's part one of your question. And then part two, um, I mean, are you talking about what percentage you work on or? Yeah. I mean, there is, I mean, I would say that the industry standard is probably 15% for managers on, um, on all income that you have worked on. So that means that any royalties that the artist gets from records prior to you working on that, you wouldn't commission on. So like any release that I've worked on, royalties from there on out, obviously any shows that have come in the diary since I've worked on it. 15% is the, was the industry standard, a lot of bigger management companies are now charging 20%, but it also depends on what you can offer. If you have a big management team and you have a social media team there and you have a, maybe a person that does PR, then that takes out a lot of third parties that the artist would maybe otherwise pay for. So again, it depends if, are you just one person? Um, I don't wanna say just one person. Are you one person or are you a team? But I would say that's the rough, the rough percentage that we're working with in the industry. Yes. to hear. Yes. We are a little swapped. Now, <laughs> yes, I just was telling, you know, thank you for this conversation. You know, I think it's very clarified. I, I you explained it very, very well. My question is, uh, how do you manage the relation with the, with the specialized press through the agents in the, in, in the countries? Do you do it by yourself? And what are you thinking about about that? I have a we have a press agent for Sasha, for example. Um, it's a girl called Lydia Laws, who's fantastic. Just gonna give her a little shout out here. Um, I think if you have the capacity to take on a press agent, um, capacity in terms of budget, it's definitely worth doing it because I think it's just a whole nother job, you know, rather than just you know the manager doing it. But obviously, you know, if there's no budget to hire a separate press agent, then, you know, you have to look at what relationships do you have with media partners and with journalists. And I mean, I know everyone at Mixmag or at DJ Mag, I can send them stuff directly. But obviously, it's really great if you can have someone that can handle that because 
Whereas I might just be sending things out to people, if you have really a dedicated press person, they will also play into overall strategy. And kind of like with shows, like I was saying to Danny before, is like, you know, maybe not take that show to get that show. It's the same with press, you know, you might hold off a hold off this interview because then we can get a placement with this bigger publication with this interview. And to or in order to build that strategy behind press, you really need to have a separate person on board because otherwise your head's gonna explode. And you maybe just also don't have the know-how because like I said before, people are good at different things. You can't be the best at everything. You can try. And just to add to that, I mean, I think also the promoters that a performing artist works with in the different territories has to be one of your first protocols if you don't have a press agent, see what kind of press and what support they can generate when you're touring. Uh, Marin, thank you so much for your thank insights. You. It was really, really interesting. Uh, thank you all for taking Thanks, guys. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your IMS, and everyone have a good dance tonight. Yeah, we're going to bring Nick straight in, so uh, uh, don't move.